finally, a book I don't hate. So, I've cheated a bit this week. The book I'm currently reading, I haven't finished yet, so I wasn't able to talk about it today. Um, it's very long and I will get through eventually. So instead we're looking at one of my favourite children's books, Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine. Um, my people probably know this book better as a film with Anne Hathaway, hence the front cover of my copy. Um, it is a fun film, I'll give it that, but considering all the uh, liberties they took with the plot and the characters and the meaning, it's not really Ella Enchanted, so read the book instead, it is very good. Um, now, Ella Enchanted is basically a retelling of Cinderella, which I didn't realise for ages, which is pretty bad considering it literally says Cinderella with a twist on the front, so uh, me being a bit thick. Um, I'm not entirely though, because Cinderella, it does sneak up on you. Um, you think you're Cinderella, you think, oh, the girl in servitude, a step family, and then the balls and the prince and the godmother and the magic shoe um, but you don't really get the setup with the stepmother and, stu and stuff till the, near the end so it doesn't feel like Cinderella till the last um, like quarter at which point you know them too well as the characters they are rather than the Cinderella characters so uh, you know right so Ella Enchanted is about Ella or Eleanor who is cursed when she's a baby with the gift of obedience which basically means that any order she's given, she is forced to follow it. Um, or at least has to attempt to obey it, because sometimes you tell her to do something impossible. As long as she tries to do it, she doesn't get repercussions. Because um, if she doesn't obey orders, she gets sick and dizzy and stuff like that. So it's a pretty terrible curse, and the book is essentially about her struggles living with the curse and her attempts to break it and become a, a normal girl. So um, let's get into the good stuff, because for, for, for a change there's quite a lot of good stuff. First of all, it's got a very charming and whimsical tone to it, which is what you want from a kid's book, so it is very enjoyable to read. It's got surprisingly good pacing for what is a really quite a small book. Um, it takes place over about a year and a half. Um, but it's only like 180 pages long and it's quite big writing, so well, not massive writing, but it, it's very quick to read it. You can read it in a day. Um, so it's just quite impressive that the pacing is so good, considering it feels like it should be rushed, but it's not. Probably because the author um, isn't afraid to just kind of skip months at a time if nothing interesting happens, <laughs> which is something a lot of YA books seem to, to not do, hence characters fall in love in about a week. Uh, but this one gives the characters kind of a chance to grow and, and stuff so mm. um the romance in it is actually really nice it's very believable again because it takes place over a longer period of time um and they have a really solid friendship for most of the book which makes the romance itself a lot more believable and you want them to then get together because they do work so well together they have a lot of chemistry Ella and the um the prince character um again it's quite rare in a lot of books these days they I do like romance. I nearly I nearly planned a whole kind of section about romance in this, but then I cut it out because the romance part alone was a, alone was about a page long and I thought I don't have time. Maybe I'll talk about romance in a different video, but um Um so the romance is very good, which is rare and makes me happy. The characters are really good fun to read about. Um it is a kid's book, so they are a little bit <laughs> stereotypical, I guess, but they are so fun that I don't really care. Um, the main character, Ella, is the best character. Um, she's really good fun to follow. She's sort of rebellious and feisty and spunky. Um, she's really smart. She's cunning. Um, she is very funny. Um, one of the major part of the romance is they kind of bond over humour. Um, she is quite funny and witty. Um, and she's just really nice like it's rare to find a female character who is neither the damsel useless distress lady nor is she like a you know so strong and dependent that she's a 
really unlikable person. Um, she's done a good job there. Um, and she is good as a Cinderella because she isn't a doormat. Most Cinderellas become doormats because otherwise why else would she allow a step family to come in and, you know, force her into servitude? Never makes much sense, but with this, like the curse, I mean, she has to obey their orders, but she doesn't like to. She does whatever she can to kind of not obey the curse in whatever small way she can manage. Um, for instance, if you tell her to hold a bowl, she'll hold it, but then she'll walk around the room with it. If you tell her to go pick some almonds, she'll come back with two. That sort of thing. So she's really fun, and you, you just like her immediately from the, the get-go, so she's a really good character to follow. And the other characters are quite good as well. Um, her dad, Peter, is not nasty, but he's very selfish, but not evil, so he's, he's an interesting one. Um, Dame Olga is hilarious. Mandy's, um, who's the cook, is really nice, motherly figure. It's they're just a really lovely host of characters who are really, really good fun to read about. Um, and the world building is, is surprisingly unique. Um, so it's sort of based in a, like a European fantasy, oldie worldy sort of setting that you see in a lot of fantasy fiction, but. It's got all the little details that you just don't tend to see. Um, so, for instance, like there's different kingdoms that have actually different human languages, which is quite rare in these sort of books. You don't often get different languages and human characters amongst adult fantasy. So to have it in a kid's fantasy book is is quite impressive. Um, and then again, there are different languages for different races. So there are ogres and elves and gnomes and giants. They all have their own language. Um, which Ella is very good at understanding. She's really good at languages and picks them up very easily. Um, so it makes the, feel, the world feel quite real and textured and big. Um, and there's other things as well, like there's like a menagerie, like a zoo thing that sort of fantasy creatures are kept at, which is quite a modern idea, but it's implemented very well in an oldie worldy style world. Um, there are things like centaurs and dragons in the zoo. And the centaurs, instead of being like smart, annoying, reading the stars, prophets as they usually end up being cast in fantasy worlds, um, they're just like animals. They're, they're not human intelligent at all. They're just sort of like horses, but with a human looking face stuck on them. Um, and like the elves are different. So instead of your Tolkien, tall, beautiful, blonde haired, forest people they are like actually forest people who are slightly green and mostly eat fruit and vegetables usually in liquid form um so, so yeah even though it feels like it should be a stereotypical fantasy world it isn't it is a bit different and it, it just makes it unique unique enough to stand out from the others and again it, it's a children's book it doesn't need to go that far into it it doesn't need to do any of this and yet you can tell through um, the author's writing that this is a world that is very fleshed out. We're just seeing the surface of it. So yeah, it, it's really good world building, I think. Um, it could be more in depth if it was an adult book and had like more space to explore it. But f again, for how small the book is, it does a really, really good job. Um, I, could, I could probably talk way more about all the good stuff in it because this is one of my favorite books and I love it. Um, but I'll just end up gushing, I think, and I can't think of any more specific general writing things to say about it. So I will attempt to talk about problems within it, which will be difficult because I love it and I really have to struggle to find problems to talk about, but we'll give it a go. When I was rereading it a few days ago, I tried really hard to look for issues within it and I only really found two things that irked me slightly. One is just minor prose issues and these are really minor things. Um, it's, it's the sort of stuff that because I spent four years doing workshops, <laughs> writing workshops, I'm kind of my brain has been trained to read everything with a super critical eye looking for anything I can point out as maybe could be tweaked. Um, and it's really just things like sentence structure that 
you know, if I had a red pen, I would have circled it and been like, oh, just just swap these phrases around or something. But but it is such a small thing, and I don't think the prose as a whole is weak. I think it's a bit simple, but children's book. But I don't think it's weak. It's it's very small little bits like that. Um, and the only other thing really are two characters, Hattie and Olive. Um, so Hattie and Olive become the stepsisters and they are perhaps a little more pantomime-ish than the other characters, apart from arguably Dame Olga, but you know, she doesn't really do much apart from swoon around the background, so yeah. Um, but Hattie and Olive are not described as being very attractive. Um, Olive is the sort of younger, stupid one and Hattie is the older, cruel, conniving one. Um, so Olive has like, you know, she's grabbing really thin, weak hair and Hattie has like really large front teeth like a rabbit. So she's describing like a rabbit a couple of times. And they're both sort of on the larger side. Olive more obviously, but I, I missed that Hattie was meant to be large until the last time I read it because then she describes a fat rabbit and I thought oh right okay she's me and you know oh they're fat so every time there's food in the book they be eating and they eat stupid amounts so you know that whole spiel which is a bit tired these days but I don't think that was the author's intention with it um you see Hattie and Olive very much um represent greed that's what they are they always want things Hattie wants power and Olive wants money and they're always asking for this or trying to take it. Um, and I feel like the, the food thing, A, it's, it's a stupid joke that little kids will find funny. And B, it, it's just an extension of that greed. It's that wanting things and wanting to have it and consume it and keep it for yourself. So reading it again, I ummed and ahed at it, but I'm not I don't think that was how um, the author had intended it to be read. I think it's just an unfortunate reading of it. Um, but, but apart from that, you know, it it is a children's book. It's a simple children's book. It's a retelling of Cinderella and it's never really meant to be that deep. It's just a bit of fun. Um, so it's really difficult to get upset at all with any of these little tiny issues when they're just really not that important to it. And also the rest of it is so good. I don't really want these issues to take away from it. So yeah, if, if pushed to find things to criticize the pros at times, I would tweak it and possibly Hattie and Olive as characters could do with a little bit more depth, but I don't think those are things one needs to take away from the book. I think there are far better and good things one can enjoy when reading it. Um, so let's actually go into the plot, if it's a bit less important, because I like it so much, but um, I think we should go into the plot because otherwise I've nothing else to talk about. <laughs> First of all, if you want to read this book, I'd read it without the without the spoilers because I think it's it's more enjoyable that way. Um, okay, I'm sure everyone who wants to read it has gone now. Right. So the book opens with um, Ella's upbringing. It starts actually with her, the birth, um, wherein she is cursed with obedience by the fairy Lucinda, who is sort of notorious for giving terrible gifts at births and weddings, which is what fairies are known to sort of go to. Um, so the obedience curse is therefore only known by Ella, Mandy, her mum, Lucinda and her fairy godmother who was also present, but the fairy godmother couldn't do much about it. Um, the first chapter or possibly two chapters are just about Ella's growing up with the curse. Um, like she had a friend at one point who found out about it and used it to make Ella lose all the games so then Ella punched her in the face. Um, stuff like that. Um, and then we kind of 
jump ahead to Ella is just about to turn 15 and her mum dies because of course she does, it's Cinderella, we've got to get the mum out of the way. Um, at the funeral, which is sort of where the book really begins, it's the funeral, um, and Ella, who's crying, is told to go away by her dad because oh, she'll embarrass me in public by crying at her mother's funeral, how terrible. So she runs off and she eventually actually meets the prince, whose name I've never had to say out loud before and I realise I don't know how you say it. It looks vaguely French, so I want to say Charmant, but that sounds really stupid. So I'm just going to use the shortened version, which is what he goes by, which is Char. Although that's now making me think of like Char grilled aubergines. And Charmander. Char Charmander, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to call him Charmander now. <laughs> Um, so she meets him at the funeral. He sort of knew her mum as well, and he has some nice stories about how fun she was. The mum was really fun. Um, she was a lady, but she had really good humour, and she used to like fold napkins into people's faces and stuff like that, and slide down the banisters. Um, so the mum was great, but uh, she's dead, so never mind. Um, Charles seems quite also seems quite nice. Um, immediately, I guess enamoured with Ella, but Ella doesn't really notice because she's like oh my gosh it's the prince oh what do i do um uh, the, later on the prince goes away um and then we get to the wake or funeral after party whatever you call it i don't know what they call it in this um where we meet hattie olive and dame olga um dame olga is just like insane i love her she's so over, over the top and flamboyantly mm. I th you probably know the character, it's this sort of older lady who goes into the room in a sort of gauzy gowns and large skirts and uses long words and you know, oh you must be distraught my dear, like that, she's very funny. Um, Hattie and Olive are just, you know, the panto stepsisters. Um, they go around the house counting all the windows and saying, well, Hattie says how much each window is probably worth and how many KJs, which are the coins they use. Um, everything must have cost. And they go to the banquet and they go, oh, 25 quail eggs at seven KJs a piece. <laughs> it's a bit odd, <laughs> but it, it does work. You see immediately how materialistic they are and how they see everything as money, everything for its sort of monetary value. Whereas Ella just doesn't even care. She she doesn't really care much about um, that sort of stuff. Which does sort of work for a Cinderella story when I think about it. Um, sort of the, main, the main complaint about the original fairy tale is that it's very materialistic. Everyone's more concerned about the shoe and identifies the shoe more than they identify the girl who was wearing the shoe. So it's quite, it's quite fun, I think, to bring up that greed and materialism in a retelling of Cinderella because that was a big thing in it really um so after the wake um we go to the menagerie ella finds out she's gonna go to finishing school because she can't she can't drink wine out of a glass without spilling it and she can't walk in a dress that's obviously too big for her therefore finishing school and um, so she goes to the menagerie to say goodbye to all her favorite animals and stuff there she likes talking to the parrots and she meets prince char again so they kind of walk around and they have a nice conversation. You see they get on really well. Um, they make each other laugh. It's very, it's very sweet. Um, but alas, it can't last. Ella goes back home. She's going off to finishing school, but she does find out when pestering Mandy about her mother's death, that Mandy is the fairy godmother and has been apparently the fairy godmother to the Eleanor family for like, many generations she's really really old so that's that's fun um um so she goes to finishing school mandy gives her a couple of gifts including a fairy book like a book of fairy stories that change every time she opens it so like she never runs out of stories and the book will also feature things like letters journal entries pictures maps and things of random other characters so we kind of see what other people are doing which is lovely and also a silver and pearl necklace that was Ella's mum's that um, and Mandy managed to sort of salvage and give to her because Ella should have it. So that's nice. She's shipped off to finishing school along with Hattie and Olive who are also going. Um, on the carriage ride down Hattie realises that 
Ella is has to be obedient. Um, she doesn't know that it's a curse, but she knows that Ella has to do whatever she says and begins to abuse this by making her give her the nice necklace um, and, like, doesn't let her eat for the entire journey. Um, Ella tends to get her back by, like, chucking her shoes at the window and stuff, but there are only very small victories. Finishing school is terrible because they have to wear disgusting yellow dresses with pink ribbons. <laughs> I don't know why these, these sort of schools really have... always have awful fashion sense. I don't understand it, but... They always do. Um, so Ella learns how to be a lady by making very, very tiny stitches in her embroidery and singing at the right pitch and dancing and talking and stuff like that. Um, she meets a friend, a reader, I think, hey, I don't know how you pronounce her name. I want to say a reader, who comes from a, another kingdom called a author. Um, a reader is kind of picked on by the students because A, she's not like, rich like they all are, and she also looks different, like she's she's sort of a darker complexion and different hair and an accent. Um, so no one really wants to be friends with her, apart from Ella, who actually begins to learn Aeorthian from her, which is nice. So they have a nice friendship until Hattie says that they must not be friends anymore because she doesn't like Ella not being miserable. Ella responds by running away from finishing school. Um, she finds out from her magic book that her father is going to a giant wedding. It is a wedding of giants, not a big wedding, although it is quite big. Um, and she thinks, ah, oh, Lucinda might be there. The fairy who cursed me, I'll see if I can persuade her to lift the curse. So she, she runs away. Um, she meets up with some elves who are quite fun. And then she um, gets attacked by ogres. Um, so ogres are the sort of, I guess, the... <laughs> The evil race is a bit like the orcs in Lord of the Rings. Um, they're not very nice. They eat people and whatever they can get their hands on. Um, they also have a distinctive sort of language that allows them to be very persuasive. There's a line that says that they look at you and immediately know your secrets, uh, which seems to be they know how to persuade you to do what they want. And there's these very silky, honey voices and lots of sounds in their in their language um ella is immediately you know trapped because hey they know that she has to be obedient because they look at her and her secrets fortunately um she m is about managing to escape by actually using their language against them so she learns their words from a dictionary she's got at the finishing school and managed to persuade them to sort of not eat her and then char turns up with some knights who are out trying to capture ogres um, so they tie up the, the ogres that had kidnapped her and then one of the knights accompanies her the rest of the way to the giant's farm where the wedding is um, the wedding is quite cool so the giant's land everything is massive like the um, the sort of string beans are about three feet long and there are cheese puffs the size of her face and all the sort of non-giant guests have to sit on like cushions that are like sofas and stuff it's quite fun um, the giant's weddings are quite fun, like instead of, you know, like an altar and they say vows, they actually, they sow seeds together, which is like, I guess, symbolic of whatever. Um, and then the wedding ceremony consists of them and people from the audience acting out their whole lives together, um, which is quite nice. They make like a house and then the kids come in, then older kids, and then it ends with the two giants lying down next to each other to symbolise their deaths together. It's very sweet, but that was quite fun. Um, Ella manages to locate three fairies. She recognises them by their tiny, tiny feet because fairies all have tiny, tiny feet. <laughs> fairy feet, which I like because I've got very small feet, so, you know, fairy feet. She recognises Lucinda because Lucinda's the only attractive one. Like, what a fairy ought to look like because she's really slender and has big eyes and clear skin and looks very pretty. Um, but Lucinda doesn't seem particularly nice. Lucinda realizes she's staring at her, and Ella, terrified that Lucinda's going to turn her into a squirrel, because one of the fairies says, don't turn her into a squirrel, you don't know that squirrels live charming and lovely lives. So she pretends to be from Aeortha and pretends not to understand a word of Kirish? Kyrian? I don't know what their language is, like English, basically. Um, so... Rather horribly, Lucinda tells her to be happy with her curse. 
I realise I'm going into a lot of detail, but it's such a short book, I don't know what to leave out. Lucinda tells her to be happy with her curse, which is horrifying because Ellie is forced to be jubilated that, um, I don't think that's a word, very, very happy that she is forced to obey orders. Um, she finds her father at the wedding. The father doesn't seem too concerned she's run away from finishing school. Um, and they go home. Peter reveals that um, they are in financial ruin because he he's a merchant and he sold something that didn't belong to him. Oops. And now they've got nothing. Um, he wants Ella to marry some old Earl, who's like really old. Um, but then, and he like, he makes her eat these elven mushrooms, which make one particularly agreeable um, which sort of force her to not fall in love with the Earl, but, you know, it's a bit dodgy, it's a bit like drugging your child, which is horrifying. Um, but fortunately, um, Peter decides the Earl isn't rich enough, so they don't get married. Instead, Peter has to marry Dame Olga, because he knows that Dame Olga has a massive crush on him. So, hence, we get the stepmother and the stepsisters come in. Um, at the wedding, Ella meets Char again. They decide to just kind of slip out of the wedding as soon as it's finished because, well, Lucinda's there and uh, Ella knows that Lucinda will recognise her and doesn't want to be found out as having lied to her. So they go around, they go up this tower um, and they, you know, look for this secret tunnel that was apparently exists. They don't find it, but that's just a fun thing to talk about. Um, instead they find a little inside garden and in the inside garden is a bench and in, under the bench, if you lift it up, there is a box with some glass shoes and some like disgusting old gloves. The glass shoes are fairy made um, and being fairy made they're very very tiny and therefore fit Ella because she's got very tiny feet because there's some fairy blood in her family which only gave her tiny feet and nothing else. Um, and they kind of have fun and they they um, like fly down the banisters a few times because no one's there looking and it's really sweet. Um, unfortunately, Ella has to go home with her new family. Um, Peter, oh, Lucinda's there and she gives um, Peter and Olga the gift of always loving each other. So basically forced to completely love each other, which it, weirdly isn't the worst curse. She gave, she gave the giant couple the gift of never being apart so they could never be apart from each other which was horrifying um anyway peter uh, goes off pretty quickly on his merchanting again um dame olga having found out that uh peter and ella have no money decide that ella must be a servant because she doesn't have any money thus begins ella's servitude to olga hattie and olive and she is made completely miserable um, Char goes off for a year to Aortha as like a state visit thing. So they communicate via letters, which are very nice letters. Um, and in the letters, about six months in, Char reveals that he's in love with her. Um, and basically asks her to marry him because they'd have this joke about her always being too young to get married or too hungry to be married or too small to be married. Um, so he's like, I'm not joking. I love you. Um, she's very happy because she realised she loves him too. But, oh wait, no, I can't marry him because he'll be the king and then people would probably realise that I'm forced to be obedient and then they could make me do terrible, terrible things. And that would suck. So she um, forges a letter from Hattie saying that Ella had run off with some rich old count and was going to inherit all his stuff. Um, and that... Char should not think of Ella anymore, so she basically breaks his heart and hers, but she's protected him from possibly being made to do something terrible like killing him in the future. Mandy gets upset and summons Lucinda and says, you suck, your gifts are terrible, how about you try living with these gifts for a bit, three months as a squirrel, because you turn someone into a squirrel thinking squirrels were great, and then three months as obedience. So Lucinda goes off to do this. Well, she's kind of tricked into doing it, but I'm, whatever. Um, uh, so roughly six months later, um, Char returns and 
the royal family are going to hold three balls, or apparently he's going to choose his bride. <gasps> Um, Ella wants to go because she wants to just see him a few more times and she says about you know I will go to the balls and at every ball my heart will be fixed upon seeing him again and then it will break as soon as I leave and it's like oh Ella why are you doing this to yourself don't torture yourself like this she's also kind of jealous whenever you like talk to other girls it's, it's quite funny um, she ends up wearing gowns that used to belong to her mother which now fit her of course because she's come of age um and lucinda magics up some jewelry for her so she looks like on trend um so she goes to the balls she goes as layla from uh i can't remember the bast where the carriages are orange because her carriage is made from a pumpkin because that is small magic there's a whole thing throughout the whole book about fairy magic being big or small and most fairies only do small magic, apart from this, and do just big magic. But I don't know what is big and what's small. It just seems to depend on what the plot requires for them to either do or not do. Um, Lucinda does what she considers small magic by giving her the jewellery and, like, making pumpkins into carriages so they're still orange and the footmen out of lizards and all that stuff. Um, so Ella goes as Layla and... Um, sort of charms Char again. Like, he quite likes her, but he's resolved to never marry. So he just likes having her as a friend. But at the third ball, it's a masquerade ball, so we're all wearing masks, and he doesn't recognise her. At the third ball, Hattie, who is suspicious of this random woman who always has Char's attention, but always wears a mask, decides to rip it off her face and revealing that it's actually Ella. So, you know, she runs off. She's wearing the glass slippers. You know, it falls off her foot. As she's running, she goes back to the the, the home. She and Mandy are going to run away, but then Char turns up, and it's the whole, you know, snipper on the foot. The two stepsisters decide they must try it on first. It doesn't fit them because they've got big, ugly feet. And it fits Ella because she's got tiny fairy feet, and it would fit no one else because fairy feet. Um, so he's like, ah, oh, you are here. You didn't marry the Count. Do you tell me if you love me? And she says, oh, I do love you. Um... But she's crying because she's like, oh no, this isn't meant to happen. I'm cursed. I'm going to ruin everything. Um, so he's telling her to marry him. Hattie's telling her to not. Olga's like, don't you want your sister to get married and give you lots of nice stuff? Um, Ella's having a very bad time because she doesn't want to. But due to all the stress and horror and, you know, she's got to save his life and the kingdom. She actually manages to break the curse. By saying, no, I'm not going to marry you. Shove off. Um, I haven't realised she broke the curse. She says she will marry him. So then they get married. She doesn't become a princess because she doesn't want to be a princess. She becomes the court languages expert or something like that. Um, and they live happily ever after the end. A lot, quite a lot happens when I think about it. I feel like I must have missed a few bits out, but I don't really, I don't really care enough. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't really have very much to add, to be honest. Um, I can't really say what I'd change about it, because honestly, I really wouldn't change very much. It would be very tiny things, like little sentence structure bits. Um, it's just a really fun read, and I think if you like fairy tales, or romance, or fantasy, or just children's books in general, I really think you'd enjoy it. And even though it is a children's book, um, I think anyone of any age will find something in it so you know even if you're like 50 you probably like it i'll probably still read it when i'm 50. talking about the plot has reminded me about the fairy magic thing which was something i did take a little bit of issue with i didn't write it down for some reason but i did remember that it was very annoying um so mandy will always say oh i can't do this that and the other because it's big magic um because oh it might have consequences i can't foresee and sometimes it makes sense like i don't want to stop the rain because then it could cause a drought i don't want to then try and bring back the rain because then i might cause a flood um stuff like that but then she also you know once ella asks her for an umbrella and she's like oh that's big magic is it though it's an umbrella what so that that was a bit annoying and almost inconsistent but it wasn't too irritating because ella was also getting quite irritated um a bit sort of like I think it's called lamp shading, where you kind of point out flaws in the in the within the media itself, 
Um, and if you point them out, then critics have a harder time than making a point about that flaw because the thing itself has already acknowledged the flaw. So it felt a little bit like that. But it's fairy magic. Maybe fairy magic is very, very fickle. Um, it was, I guess, I guess, a little bit convenient, but mm, part of the part of the world, I suppose. Um, so yeah, and Gail Carson Levine has written tons of books. A lot of them the same sort of vein, fantasy fairy tale. They're all quite different though. Um, she's written another one set in the same world called Ferris, which is a version of Snow White. Um, although that's more obviously Snow White because the main character is the pale as snow and red as blood and black as the whatever it was. Ebony or a raven or something, I can't remember. That's bad, isn't it? Um, but unsurprisingly, she's not particularly attractive because dark hair and lips don't tend to suit white skin, like pale, pale skin. So it's Snow White, but different. Um, that's also quite a good read, but I think this one's a bit better. Um, so yeah, if I think if you like fairy tales, read this. If you've read this and liked it, go read her other books because they're also very sweet and charming. So yeah, thanks for watching. Give a a like or a comment or a subscribe or whatever the YouTube things are. I don't know. I don't really care. Bye.